Dr. Harold Varmus, what's the role of the National Institutes of Health? Well, the major role is to make discoveries that improve our ability to confront the diseases of the nation and the world. Uh, but it has a lot of other functions as well, which include training and uh, public outreach and communication. Uh, and uh, it remains uh, one of the great creations of, of American government. How does it work with private uh, investigative research uh, laboratories and colleges? Well, the way it supports research is in, in, in small part by, uh, by funding the researchers who work on the campus in Bethesda and a few other places, people who are government scientists. But the majority of the money, well over 80 percent, uh, goes to investigators around the country and indeed around the world who apply for grants that uh, are then reviewed by peers and when judged meritorious, and especially these days when money is tight, highly meritorious, uh, get funded uh, to do the research that they're interested in. Is enough money given to the National Institutes of Health right now in your view? Well, there's never enough money from the point of view of the investigator who just missed the pay line, but uh, the NIH budget is a large budget as agency standards go, but you have to understand the dynamic of funding NIH. That is that NIH flourishes when there are steady, predictable increases in funding because it does its, uh, it, it, it does its work in an unusual way. It gets an annual appropriation from Congress, which very much enjoys hearing about what NIH does and likes giving money every year. Um, but NIH gives out its, its money to investigators, to scientists, uh, for multiple years. People can't do a research project in one year. They get a promise that they'll get money for four or five years. So every year, the directors of the NIH institutes to whom the money is appropriated uh, have to begin their, their, their grant making with the recognition that they've already promised money to a lot of investigators in previous years. So if there aren't continued increases, uh, the NIH becomes constrained. And that's, what, uh, that's the strange situation that prevails right now. Uh, starting in the late 90s, uh, NIH began a five-year process of budget doubling, and the budget went from about, uh, about $13 billion to nearly $27 billion. But since then, budgetary rises have been stagnant, below the level of inflation. The result is that uh, the rates of success for NIH investigators has gone down. Um, and uh, at a time of tremendous opportunity, many more people working in the field now um, without going into much more detail because you don't want to hear more about this uh, at this stage, um, the NIH recently received a uh, little over $10 billion under the uh, Recovery Act, uh, which has made a difference, but that's two-year money. It's not in the regular budget, and while everyone is very happy to have that money, there is the danger that uh, two years from now, uh, when that money ceases, if there are no increases in the base budget, NIH will again be in this period of constriction. A large budget, but many people doing great work and an inability to fund new grants. Well, we are pleased here on Book TV to have Dr. Harold Varmus join us for a live call-in program. His new book is called The Art and Politics of Science. Dr. Varmus is former director of the NIH, of the National Institutes of Health. He is currently president of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and he is a Nobel laureate in medicine. So we want to put the numbers up. We're talking about funding for science and health. 202 is the area code, 737 for those of you who live in the east and central time zones. 202-737-0002, Mountain and Pacific. If you'd like to talk with Dr. Varmus, go ahead and dial in. We'll begin taking those calls in just a minute. Dr. Varmus, we kind of covered a little bit there in that opening with uh, the politics of science, but what's the art of science? Well, uh, the art term is there because I myself began my, my career um, not in science but in, uh, in literature. And, uh, and what, I'm, what I was trying to um, indicate by putting art in the title is that, uh, that um, an interest in the arts um, has, uh, has, a, has connection to a, a life in science. As scientists, we write, we listen to each other, we make slides that, uh, that portray our craft in a, hopefully in an artistic way. Um, and uh, uh, then there is the, the, the strategy of science, which I find fascinating. There's how to, you, you're faced with a problem like understanding how a retrovirus grows. What kind of strategies do you use to understand that phenomenon? 
And you know, this is a, an ancient one. Uh, just this morning I was reading an essay by J.B.S. Haldane, a famous geneticist who died in 1964, who wrote an essay in 1927 about uh, what biologists will learn in the future. And he talks about the same kinds of questions, but the strategies for solving, for getting answers to those questions are clearly different because the tools he had, the paintbrushes he had, the kind of easel he had were, were, were inherently different. How did you get from literature into medicine then? Well, actually it was a two-step process. I, I grew up on the south shore of Long Island, the, uh, the um, um, academically accomplished son of, of, a, of, a, of a, uh, Jewish parents, one of whom was a physician, one was a psychiatric social worker, and in that environment it was sort of destined that I would be labeled as a future doctor. And indeed, I thought of myself as a future doctor, went off to, to, to college, to Amherst College, with the idea that I was slated to be a doctor. That's, that's what my genetic imprint was. Um, but when I got there, I learned that there were lots of other wonderful things to do, in philosophy and physics, and, and, uh, and, and then finally English literature drew me very strongly uh, to um, its uh, core opus. And uh, I, I run the college newspaper, and I was interested in being a writer and teacher. Went off to graduate school in English literature for a while. Uh, and while I was there, suddenly began to feel that half of my brain that does, that's analytic and scientific, you know, would not achieve full expression in the, in the, in the crucible of, of English literature. So I decided to go, to go to medical school after all. And after suffering my second rejection from Harvard, I settled on Columbia Medical School, which was a great place to go because it brought me to New York, which is the city I love best. Um, and uh, uh, as I got deeper and deeper into medicine, I found that, that the craft of medicine, the art of medicine, while appealing at one level, didn't seem to be making enough use of what scientists were teaching about the basic phenomena of life. I started medical school only a few years after we began to learn some of the what we call the central dogma, that is, genes are embedded in DNA, that DNA has a code, uh, that the code is, is read in a, in a logical way, uh, and that uh, you could actually understand disease. And at that time, in the early 60s, we knew that, uh, for example, disorders of hemoglobin, certain, certain anemias, could be explained by very simple mutations that then manifest themselves as, uh, as physiological states that we call disease. And I was intrigued by being able to do more of that, uh, and, and then was given um, <clears throat> something I wouldn't necessarily even call a choice. That is, I needed to do something about military service. It was the Vietnam War era, and I was deeply opposed to the war, didn't want to leave the country. Fortunately, for people like me, there was an alternative, which is to serve in the public health service, in the CDC, or at the Indian Health Service, or NNIH. And even though I had no significant research experience at that point, I was able to get a place at the NIH, which, as you heard, is a great training vessel, for, especially for, for people like me who had medical backgrounds. And even though I started working at the NIH on a problem that, that now might seem fairly remote from what I do now in the world of cancer research, it was an effort to understand how bacteria regulate gene expression in a, in a very rigorous way. And what I learned from that, and a, a, that I think the <coughs> public needs to understand, is that some of the great questions in biology can be answered not by looking at the obvious place um, in a cancer cell, but sometimes by looking at a non-obvious place, like a bacterial uh, strain that, uh, that has been well studied, where you have a lot of mutants to, and phenomena to, to probe. Simple systems simple, reduce the question to its most simple form, and you learn deep truths. And that's, a, that's something we need to keep in mind at a time when the public has very happily gotten very engaged with the idea that medical research is good for public health. But we have to remember that many of the deep truths that uh, propel our ability um, forward to, to understand disease come from looking at what may seem like uh, an unexpected place. You've referenced a 1927 paper and early 60s medical research. In this world of medicine today, Aren't those fairly remote from what we know today? Well, the concepts are, are still, in many cases, valid. I was trying to explain the nature of research strategy and, uh, and I should argue that the, what I was citing from the 1960s is really just about as far as we've gotten. That is, um, what we know about sickle cell anemia, for example, or thalassemia, is really embedded in what we learned in the early 60s. Now, since then, 
We have learned how to manipulate DNA. We have Genome Project. We know how to do DNA testing. We have been able to do things like uh, genetic testing to reduce the incidence of some of these diseases very dramatically and, and uh, diagnose them at birth. So there have been advances, but we still don't have a way to cure sickle cell disease, for example, or cure thalassemia in a conventional sense.